I'm Eddie Muller, and we're celebrating Mother's Day weekend, the way we always do in Noir Alley, with a visit to the Women's State Prison. Now, don't worry. You don't have to leave the comfort of your home or your hotel room or your jail cell while we watch Caged. Now, since its release in 1950, the film has come to be known, unfortunately, as a camp classic. And that's largely because the tropes of prison films, when enacted by an all-female cast, have for decades mainly been fodder for titillating sexploitation movies. When I came of age in the 70s, it was a rite of passage to sneak into R-rated pictures like The Big Birdcage and Chained Heat to watch Pam Greer and Sybil Danning battle through the big house, typically in various states of undress. And once Tom Ian created his 1975 stage parody, Women Behind Bars, with the warden played by transvestite superstar Divine, all whips were instantly and retroactively reclassified as camp. Now, FYI, whip is now the official hipster designation for women in prison movies. Now, women have been getting brutalized behind bars in movies since the silent era, when Cecil B. DeMille made a couple of groundbreaking whips, Manslaughter and The Godless Girl. Barbara Stanwyck did her time in the pre-code melodrama Ladies They Talk About, written by actress Dorothy McKay, when she was in the big house, convicted of being an accessory in the death of her husband. Early whips always had two things in common. They were written by women and they all had a saintly male priest or social reformer on hand to steer the star to redemption. Which brings us to today's film, also written by a woman. Virginia Kellogg had a hand in two of the most testosterone-heavy films of the era, T-Men and White Heat. Both were based on her original stories. As a former reporter, Kellogg's strong suit with authenticity based on first-hand research. And for Caged, she went the whole nine yards. She brought the idea to Warner Brothers producer Jerry Wald in 1948 under the title Women Without Men. And Wald enthusiastically got the studio to send Kellogg around the country investigating the workings of women's prisons. In one case, Kellogg was incarcerated for two weeks and treated like any other prisoner. Now, from her perspective, there was nothing campy about the experience. It scared the hell out of her. She telegrammed Wald that she was learning, quote, shocking facts that far surpassed The Snake Pit, a 1948 film that revealed the horrors of mental institutions. Now, Kellogg's investigative essay, Inside Women's Prison, was published in Collier's Magazine to coincide with the release of Caged. Her descriptions of institutional corruption and the ritual humiliation of prisoners hit especially hard because the inmates were women. Kellogg expressed contempt for the prison matrons whom she revealed to often be on the payroll of crime syndicates or related to politicians and just hanging on long enough to get a pension. Kellogg was so unnerved by the experience and fearful of repercussions she began toting a gun in her handbag everywhere she went. Now, writer Bernard Schoenfeld, who'd already scripted two noir gems, Phantom Lady and The Dark Corner, was hired by Jerry Wald to turn Kellogg's research into a polished screenplay. Now, by this time, Jack Warner had changed the title to Locked In, which Wald hated. There would be many name changes before the studio hit on the perfect title. Wald's initial inspiration was to cast, okay, take a deep breath, Betty Davis as Warden Benton and Joan Crawford as naive first-timer Marie Allen. Whatever happened to convict 93850? Both actresses, of course, craved the Marie Allen role, so that epic pairing would have to wait a few more years. Patricia Neal turned down the role of the warden, telling Wald that she had no interest supporting, quote, whoever played the plum role. For that part, Wald considered Doe Avedon, Betsy Drake, and even Ruth Roman before settling on Warner contract player Eleanor Parker, who'd spent several years as a reliable second lead, but had never gotten anywhere near a part this juicy. I've lived a lifetime and a year in this cage. If I have to fall back in, I'll be like the others. 
And I'm not like them. Oh, please, please give me a chance to prove it. I've paid my debt. Let me out, please. You'll never regret it. I promise I'll... Venerable character actress Agnes Moorhead signed on as the warden, enjoying for her a rare sympathetic part. Now, in truth, the warden isn't the second lead. That would be the role of prison matron Evelyn Harper, the villain of the piece, for which there was ever only one choice. Six foot, two inch, 230 pound Hope Emerson, who'd made a huge impression two years earlier in Cry of the City, intimidating tough guy Richard Conti. That's the way it used to be run, and that's the way it ought to be run. Just like they're a bunch of animals in a cage. Emerson would become one of the most memorable villains of all time, terrorizing a terrific cast that includes Betty Gard, Jan Sterling, Ellen Corby, Lee Patrick, Olive Deering, Jane Darwell, and Gertrude Michael. The cell block is chock full of great actresses, none of whom wear a speck of makeup in this decidedly unglamorous film. Now, the picture earned three Oscar nominations, Best Actress for Eleanor Parker, Virginia Kellogg and Bernard Schoenfeld for original story and screenplay, and Hope Emerson as Best Supporting Actress. From 1950, it's the mother of all women in prison movies, Caged.